Hi everyone, my name is Will DePez and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh, Department of Pediatrics. And today I'll be talking to you about the pathogenesis of non-tuberculous microbacterial infections, particularly in the context of cystic fibrosis. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. When we think of NTM associated with CF, there's two main culprits. One of them is Mycobacterium avium and members of that complex. Avium is a slow grower and it's environmentally acquired from soils or contaminated water sources and commonly from shower heads. Mycobacterium obsessus, in contrast, is a rapid grower. In addition to likely being acquired from the environment, it can also be spread patient to patient. Having obsessus correlates with uh, clinical decline. It's very resistant to antibiotic treatment. Uh, in addition, both of these things, when we test them in vitro, uh, antibiotic susceptibility doesn't correlate necessarily to uh, efficacy in, when treating patients. For the uh, purposes of today's talk, and in order to go into a little more depth, I'm gonna focus specifically on mycobacterium obsessus. Uh, microbial pathogenesis for any given bug really refers to a suite of traits or behaviors that that bug exhibits during infection that uh, contributes to the disease progression. And this right range of behaviors can be very wide. It can encompass a lot of different things. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about three different uh, traits that bacteria tend to take on during infection that can really alter the course of infection and alter how easy it is to treat these bugs. The first of them is biofilm formation. So this is the ability of single or planktonic cells to aggregate and cluster into multicellular communities. The second is host cell invasion. So this is bacterial and the, uh, the ability to invade and live inside a host cell during infection. And third, I'll touch on some uh, in vivo specific physiologies that bugs can take on that really alter uh, uh, how easy it is to treat them and how resistant they are to the host immune system also. Um, it's important to understand each of these three traits because they really determine how we should go about treating a specific bug. Um, in the case of biofilm formation, we know this forming a biofilm uh, makes you resistant to antibiotics, makes you more resistant to the immune system. So if you know enough mechanistic detail about biofilm formation and dispersal in a given pathogen, you can start to treat with dispersal agents while you treat with antibiotics and really have a more effective uh, uh, ther therapy. In the case of host cell invasion, um, if we know the specific pathways that the bacterial hijacks during uh, uh, host invasion and, and living inside the host, we can use some kind of eukaryotic modulators that, that affect those pathways in order to, to make that um, a less effective strategy for the bacteria. And third, there's specific physiology, specifically slow growth that render bacteria more resistant to uh, traditional antibiotics. But growing slowly or growing in any kind of physiological state also exposes some kind of Achilles heels, specifically the membrane potential is something you can target with antibiotics for slow growing bugs. So understanding that state allows you to make more intelligent decisions as far as what treatments to, to give. And then I'll go through these one by one and, and sort of go through what we know about mycobacterium obsessus uh, uh, in each category. So we'll start with biofilm formation. Normally when you work with any given bacterial species in the lab, you have a culture of, of planktonic cells. You expose them to some unusual or, or different condition to get them to aggregate into the cluster in these biofilms. It's a little turned on its head for mycobacteria. If you have a, just a culture of mycobacteria, they'll spontaneously clump in most liquid media um, without detergent. And then you have to expose them to a little bit of a uh, little bit different environmental conditions to get them to disperse and grow as planktonic cells. Uh, this is a, a big focus of what my lab does and tries to understand. And what we know so far is that it's, it's really the, the relative ratio of available carbon and nitrogen that dictates this transition. So if you have a lot of carbon to, uh, relative to nitrogen, you'll, you'll grow as aggregates. And the reverse is true if you start to run out of carbon and you have a lot of available nitrogen, you'll start to grow as planktonic cells. And we can, uh, we can look at this transition and then watch these dynamics with a little in vitro aggregation assay that we have where we essentially pass each of these cultures through a 20 micron strainer. What goes through, we call our planktonic fraction. What stays on top, we call our aggregates. And then we can watch dynamics over time in a given media. And this is how we like to sort of show these. So this is a heat map. In yellow, you're going to see a planktonic cell excess in every, any given culture. In blue, it's an aggregate excess in any given culture. And then you just see uh, dynamics over time and, and, and medium. This is rich medium with tryptone and yeast extract as the main carbon sources uh, and nitrogen sources. 
So over time, they grow as aggregates, uh, and then they disperse into planktonic cells as they run out of carbon. And since they're growing on amino acids, they're releasing a lot of ammonium into the medium here. If we add 0.2% glucose or any given carbon source, we extend that aggregation duration and delay uh, dispersal and growth as planktonic cells. The opposite then is true for adding ammonium. You uh, decrease aggregation duration and you, uh, uh, your transition to planktonic cells is, is earlier in the culture there. So this trend holds true for a lot of different NTM. This is just with the model strain uh, Mycobacterium smegmatis, but we also see this with abscessus. This is the ATCC strain, where more carbon uh, equals greater aggregation duration. And if you add ammonium uh, to these cultures with abscessus, what you tend to do is just completely skip the aggregation phase at all, and you just get growth as planktonic cells. This holds true for clinical isolates of Mycobacterium uh, abscessus. These are two different ones, 0253 and 0711. You see with more carbon, you increase aggregation. Uh, with more ammonium, you, you get just that uh, solely growth as planktonic cells. Uh, this little smooth next to these strain names designates a colony morphotype. Uh, this is a very common uh, way to designate Mycobacterium abscessus isolates because it's very frequent that you'll get rough colony variants. The smooth colony variant is more or less wild type. Then you, you tend to get mutations that, that uh, uh, result in this rough colony morphology. And what these are, are, are mutants that knock out or knock down a specific cell wall component. I'm going to go a little bit more into depth here because I'll talk about this quite a bit during the talk. But this is the mycomembrane. This is the cell wall of microbacteria. You have your inner membrane, your peptidoglycan, uh, an arabinogalactin layer that's covalently linked to these long chain mycolic acids, big fatty acids. Uh, in your outer leaflet of this mycomembrane, then you have non-covalently linked uh, mycolic acids, as well as a lot of other lipophilic molecules. One of these other lipophilic molecules are glycopeptidolipids, or GPLs. Um, so in the case of rough colony variants, you have acquired mutations that decrease or ablate production of GPLs. If that happens, then what we see in our in vitro aggregation assay here is that these types of strains never disperse. They basically have lost that ability to transition between the planktonic and the aggregated state. And this uh, a constitutive aggregation, we, we see it manifest in a lot of different assays and in a lot of different uh, uh, environments. One thing that we like to do in the lab is, is grow things in what we call the AB or agar block biofilm assay. And this is essentially embedding bacteria in 0.4% agar in some kind of nutrient medium, and then watching them grow within that matrix. This recapitulates some aspects then of growing in a 3D environment in sputum and CF. Uh, so this on the left is a smooth colony isolate in the ABBA. On the right, it's a rough colony isolate in the ABBA. And you're watching uh, just our little Z-stack of a confocal micrograph uh, image. And what should be apparent then is that rough colony uh, isolate uh, acquires a, a distinct sort of corded morphology in the context of the ABBA. So this uh, corded morphology, you, it's very common for mycobacteria. And if you really zoom in on a liquid aggregate of a rough colony uh, isolate in that, in that in vitro aggregation assay, you'll see sort of the same thing. It takes on these cords. There's a, a really nice model that the uh, Kramer group has put together. That's a zebrafish infection model for mycobacterium abscessus. And essentially, you see the same thing in vivo in this model. So these are zebrafish infected with a rough variant or a smooth variant of abscessus. And in the rough variant, not only is it way more virulent, but it, it results in these sort of extracellular corded aggregates growing inside the zebrafish. Um, so essentially, uh, during infection, you, you, you tend to get some kind of selection that's pushing you towards a, a constitutive aggregation phenotype. Uh, it's worth pointing out that this, the rough strains are not better at all types of biofilm formation. It turns out the smooth strains are a little better at adhering to plastic and things of that nature. But in terms of cell-to-cell -cell adhe adhesion, uh, the rough isolates make very good biofilms in a lot of systems. Okay, and we'll move on to host cell invasion now. Uh, so the cousin of, of NTM, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, is very well described as having host cell invasion and living within macrophages as part of its life cycle. Um, and a lot of NTMs can do this to, to some uh, degree or other. Abscessus uh, uh, can live and survive within macrophages, um, but it, it varies the mechanics of this process between those rough and smooth isolates. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail for each one. And there's been a lot of work uh, done in, in this context. So I'm gonna summarize a lot of really good results from a lot of good labs. 
And what we know is that single mycobacterium obsessive cells uh, of the smooth variety are phagocytosed by macrophages, usually so you get one cell per phagosome. They're able to survive uh, within that phagosome, largely due to a suite of specific genes that they express uh, during host cell infection. This is a, a lot of really good work from the Giard Mesquiche lab, who's looked at expression data uh, of mycobacterium obsessus growing not only in microphages, but also in, in am amoeba, which is likely a host or a non-host reservoir for these bugs. Uh, so one of the things they express in the macrophage is this ES ESX4 uh, type 7 secretion system, allows them to block acidification of that phagosome, uh, escape into the cytoplasmic and, rep cytoplasm and replicate. If we move back then to our, our zebrafish model, how this manifests is by some kind of uh, granuloma formation. So you see here in red, uh, macrophages, and uh, green is bacteria, and you get granuloma, and then the dogma is a, more of a chronic infection state. This varies a little bit with uh, mycobacterium obsessus of the rough variety. Usually you get small clusters of cells that are phagocytosed at the same time. These cells can uh, grow and divide intracellularly and they trigger apoptosis and then uh, eventually inflammation. And this is largely due to the difference to the, that lack of GPLs. So GPL specifically can inhibit the apoptotic pathway and they also mask underlying uh, uh, components of that mycomembrane that without GPLs trigger uh, an inflammatory response largely through TLR2. So what you end up with is you end up lysing those uh, macrophages that, that phagocytosed you in the beginning, and you grow now as these extracellular cords that I showed earlier. Okay, so we know in the context of tissue culture and some of these uh, animal models that mycobacterium obsessus can live within, uh, within macrophages, interacts with macrophages uh, in ways that are dictated largely by whether you're a rough or smooth variant. Okay, and then finally, I'll go into some physiologies that we're starting to understand about how obsessus likely lives uh, in the infection site and how it responds to the infection site metabolism-wise. This is uh, largely due to a couple of studies, um, one of which is new out of Mary Jackson's lab and one of which uh, was published a few uh, years ago out of the Loftus lab. And what these look at is essentially expression data and a few other profiling uh, uh, methods looking at how obsessus responds to CF sputum or SCFM uh, gene expression wise and then so sort of in the case of this latest paper cell surface wise. So this is just a cartoon um, that the Jackson lab put out with their paper showing essentially the, the main takeaways. These are smooth variants. They still have GPLs on the surface. When you expose them to, <clears throat> excuse me, SCFM2 or, or sputum, they alter the profile of those GPLs. So you end up with more triglycosylated GPLs and this um, novel leucinol containing GPL. Excuse me. In addition, you alter your metabolism quite a bit. So you have, uh, you start eating or catabolizing amino acids because that's now an available nutrient source. You turn down amino acid biosynthesis genes and the, the uh, Loftus lab showed that you also sort of move towards a more of a slow growing state uh, in, in SCFM2. This dovetails nicely with what we know about some of the chemistry of sputum. Some portions of the sputum environment or the CF lung environment are, are pretty anoxic. Mycobacteria needs oxygen to grow and divide. Uh, without oxygen, it goes into this uh, program dormancy state. So it, it starts to hint at some metabolism that are taking place, maybe some cell surface uh, features that at least the smooth colony is taking on uh, and potentially introduces us to maybe a slow growth paradigm for mycobacteria in the infection environment. Okay, so now what I, I've done today is sort of given you an overview of the possibilities. These are the spectrum of, of, of uh, characteristics that obsessives can take on in vitro and in, in some animal models. Now the big question becomes, are any of these behaviors or any others important for NTM pathogenesis in human disease? And this is really the, the next big step. We, we need to understand if these things are going on during uh, human infection in CEF, so we really need some really great in situ characterization of the infection environment. Um, in order to, to understand which of these we should start designing specific therapies for, and which of these sort of correlate with clinical decline. I'd like to point out that there's been some uh, nice work lately, uh, spearheading sort of this initiative in terms of biofilm formation. Uh, so this is from the Schultz lab, looking at uh, mycobacterium obsessus in, a, in a, a lung sample from a patient who had COPD. Uh, and what you can see here uh, in 
dark purple and then in dark purple here are, are clumps or clusters of, of mycobacterium obsessus, indicating that it's likely some form of biofilm that's happening uh, in vivo. Uh, Thomas Bjarnsold's group has, has done something similar in, in the context of CF. So we have expanded lung here with a PNA fish and then a sputum just with a, a stain. And you see sort of the same thing. You see these small clumps or these aggregates of mycobacteria uh, in situ. Uh, this is our focus. This is a focus of our group too. Uh, so we've poked at this a little bit using our tissue clearing method on my packed HCR. And what we do here is we get a, a sputum sample. We, we fix it, uh, embed it in acrylamide to provide structural stability. You can uh, optically clear it with a detergent with SDS. Uh, then you permeabilize the bacterial cell walls. So then you can add this fish uh, a probe or a fish amplification technique we use uh, called HCR. And then uh, you can label host components too with fluorescent dyes, and then you can do 3D uh, visualization of the infection site. So, so far what we have is that uh, blue is, is DAPI here, orange is uh, an HCR probe labeling all bacteria, green is a HCR probe specific for NTM. You see these yellow clusters essentially because they're uh, staining with both probes. But what we see so far is that you have clumps or clusters, uh, aggregates in, in, in situ. Again, pointing towards the uh, uh, possibility that, that NTM exists or forms biofilms in, in the context of disease. Okay, so uh, I'd like to go through some quick acknowledgements. Um, I've been at Pitt for about a year, a little over a year now, uh, and my technician, Ifra Malik, uh, started last September. Carlos started uh, undergraduate, he's an undergraduate researcher, he started last February. Mitch Meyer, who's my grad student, he started uh, back in April. So we've sort of been coming of age during the pandemic and I am very grateful uh, for these three. They've been sort of beacons of youthful light during this whole time and have been really fantastic. Uh, and in addition, I'd like to thank the University of Pittsburgh Department of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh for funding. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. And I'd like to thank all of you uh, for listening. So thank you. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on the epidemiology of NTM infection. And for those who are watching, please feel free to interact with me in the chat box and in the networking platform. Um, I have the following relationships to disclose related to this presentation, an NIH K01 grant and a CFF Research and Development Program grant. So NTM infections in persons with CF have been increasing in prevalence over the last several years. And in the CFF annual registry report from 2018, 13.6% of people who had mycobacterial culture performed had one or more NTM species isolated. Now, if we break that down by NTM species, we can see that 51% of people with positive NTM cultures had species in the M avium complex, while 44% had M obsessus. I'm gonna focus my talk today on M. obsessus because it is an emerging and worrisome pathogen in the CF community. Um, M. obsessus has three subspecies. Uh, the most common are subspecies obsessus and mycelians, while the more rare subspecies um, is Belletii. Um, they are worrisome pathogens because they are innately resistant to several classes of antibiotics, including having inducible resistance to macrolides. Um, they have been associated with lung function decline and chronic infections as well. But um, one of the most interesting aspects of M. obsessus is the observation of dominant circulating clones in CF populations around the world. And this was very well illustrated um, in a paper in 2016 um, where they used whole genome sequencing to sequence over a thousand isolates from over 500 patients from CF centers all around Europe as well as um, a location in Australia and one site in the US. And what they observed was that over 50% of patients had genetically similar isolates that were in um, these genetic clusters, um, including two dominant circulating clones of subspecies obsessus shown in this figure in red and green, as well as one dominant clone of mycelians shown in blue. So the pie, pie charts here show the different proportions of the different clones at the different sites. Um, and so even though they vary geographically, um, it's very interesting that all of the clones are identified in every site sampled. 
So this really, you know, makes us think about what are the modes of transmission and um, where are people acquiring their M. abscessus infection. And so the conventional wisdom is that M. abscessus and NTM are acquired from the environment because they have been, um, they have been isolated and known to be in water, in biofilms, as well as in soil. And that is where primarily we thought that people acquire their NTM. And certainly there have been examples in the literature of um, isolates from plumbing water systems and biofilms that have been genetically matched to patient isolates. Um, and there have also been examples of um, outbreaks in hospitals associated with um, mycobacterium abscessus from the water systems. So we know that it can be acquired from the environment. However, in 2012, this was the first report of any person-to-person -person transmission of NTM, in this case, um, M. obsessus subspecies mycelians at a CF center in Seattle, Washington, in which five patients were infected with the um, genetically same strain um, and epidemiologic um, investigation um, was um, supportive of person-to-person -person transmission. So a subsequent study um, in the UK that was published in 2013, and this one was a single site study at the Papworth Hospital where they sequenced over 150 um, isolates from over 35 patients in their center. This was a retrospective analysis, but through um, genetic analysis as well as epidemiologic um, investigation, they also identified um, examples of person-to-person -person transmission of M. obsessive subspecies mycelians. So after these two studies, there were um, multiple other studies from single sites um, and single CF centers in across Europe, including in the UK, Italy, and Spain, where they also did whole genome sequencing of their isolates and looked for evidence of transmission in their clinic. And so while they all of those studies found genetically similar isolates and these dominant clones, they did not find epidemiologic evidence for transmission in the clinic setting. So all of this research really, you know, led to the question of, you know, what is happening in the US CF centers? And that led to the creation of the Colorado Research and Development Program, which was funded by the CF Foundation from 2015 to 2020. And this enabled voluntary submission of NTM isolates from CF centers around the US. They could submit them to the RDP. Once received by the RDP, they would be um, stored in our bio repository, and then they would be submitted for whole genome sequencing to evaluate them um, for their genetic similarity, looking for you know, potential genetic evidence of transmission within a center. Um, if genetically similar isolates were found, then letters were sent to CF centers um, describing the isolate clusters if they had, they had to have at least two or more patients, um, which could then be followed up on in the subsequent study that I'll talk about later. Um, and all of the isolates and whole genome sequence data from the RDP is also available for research. So in the table here on the bottom, you can see the number of isolates that have been collected over the course of the RDP, including over 3,000 isolates in our biorepository, um, of which over half of them have been sequenced by whole genome sequencing. So from this data set, I'm gonna tell you a story about the population genomics of M. obsessives from USCF centers. And in this data set, we analyzed um, 558 isolates from 266 patients from 48 CF care centers across 28 states. And in this first figure, I'm just describing the data set for you and um, showing you the number of isolates per patient and on the y-axis compared to days between the first and last isolate. So for the majority of the patients, 158, we had only one isolate. However, the rest of the um, patients, we had multiple isolates, you know, spanning up to over three years. Here's the geographic distribution of these isolates um, in the sample set. And while the majority of isolates um, come from Colorado and from CF centers in Texas, um, we do have representation from many states um, from all East and West Coast and um, a pretty good representation across the country. Um, so first I'll show you a phylogenomic analysis of um, M. obsessus subspecies obsessus and mycelians. For subspecies obsessus, we had 204 patients. 
and looking at a one isolate per patient analysis, um, we can see in this phylogenetic tree that we do observe the presence of two dominant clones in our sample set, um, including the main dominant circulating clone, um, in which over 53% of our patients had. Um, this MAB clone 2, 9% of the patients in the sample set had. And these two clones do correspond to the clones in the global population study. If we look at um, our phylogenomic tree of mycelians, what we can see here is with a sample size of 64 patients, 17% had this dominant clone number one, which corresponds to the transmissible clone described in the um, Seattle and Papworth studies. And 41% of patients have this um, second dominant clone, which was not described in the global population study and um, is highly prevalent in US patients. So then we sought to look at the clinical relevance of these dominant clones, and we did this in a couple ways. First, we looked at known drug resistance mutations to aminoglycosides and macrolides. And what we're showing here are the, um, again, this is one isolate per patient, and we're showing percent of isolates on the y-axis. And we're looking, comparing the proportions of the uh, wild type genotypes, which are shown in orange, compared to the drug resistance genotypes that are in blue. And we see no significant difference between the dominant clones and the other genotypes for um, these mutations. Now for a subset of patients for which we had clinical information, um, we wanted to see whether um, there was an enrichment in dominant clones for patients who had been diagnosed with active lung disease versus persistent indolent infection. And what you can see here is there was no significant difference between these two um, diagnosis outcomes between the dominant clones and unclustered isolates. So at least by these data, we don't see um, any fitness factors for the dominant clones um, in these analyses, but it doesn't mean that they, um, they are not in, um, enriched um, for fitness factors in some other way. Um, so then next we sought to identify the highly similar isolates and potential isolate clusters. And in order to do this, we compare genome-wide single nucleotide polymorphisms, also known as SNPs. So the first thing we need to do is identify a SNP threshold um, for identifying genetically similar isolates between patients. And to do that, we first look at the um, genetic distances within patients. So if we look at the distribution of pairwise SNP distances within patients and compare that to the distribution of um, SNP comparisons between patients, where we, where we see the overlap between those distributions is where we can find a SNP threshold, which may indicate um, isolates that may have been acquired from the same source. And using a SNP threshold of 20 SNPs, we found that 43% of our patients with M. obsessus and 53% of patients with mycelians had genetically similar isolates at less than or equal to 20 SNPs to at least one other patient in the sample set. Now, the next thing we could do with these data is to see whether isolates are more genetically similar within the same CF center or within the same state um, compared to um, samples coming from different CF centers in different states. And um, through this analysis, we did find a significant difference um, between these groups. Um, and in other words, um, isolates are more genetically similar when coming from the same CF centers and the same CF states than from um, different centers and states. Um, so next we wanna take these highly similar isolates and see how they're related to each other, how, um, because it's not just one big cluster, it's multiple clusters of similar isolates. So to do this, um, we did something called a network analysis. And here um, with our um, 88 patients, we um, identified 29 different um, M. obsessus clusters. And the clusters here are shown as networks in which an oval the ovals represent a separate patient and the lines represent connections of isolates that are um, genetically similar by less than or equal to 20 SNPs. Now, if the lines have, um, are black, then they're from different CF centers. If they're red, they're from the same CF centers. So what you can see here is we identified um, quite a few clusters. However, um, out of 88 patients, only 28 patients are in clusters um, and that come from the same CF center, while the vast majority of um, the patients with highly similar isolates come from different CF centers or different CF state or different states. So overall, there are 18% of patients in our whole sample set 
that are in these genetically similar clusters and um, were seen at the same CF center. So this suggests that there are quite a few genetically similar isolates that are not related to being seen in the same CF center, um, which kind of goes along with the idea of these um, dominant circulating clones and we don't know how they've been spread around. If we do the same analysis for miscellants, so um, we find eight clusters involving 34 patients. Um, and in this case, um, we found less than half of the patients were um, in clusters from the same CF center, although these seem to be more interconnected than the M-obsessus clusters. Um, and then over half of the miscellaneous patients with highly similar isolates um, came from different CF centers or states. So overall, 23% of patients in our um, sample set were in genetically similar clusters from the same CF center. So just to conclude, the um, RDP has evaluated 558 MMSS isolates from 266 patients um, from CF centers across the country. Through this analysis, we identified two dominant clones of obsessus and two of miscellaneous that were found in over half of our subjects in the study. However, the dominant clones were not enriched for drug resistance mutations or in patients with active lung disease versus indolent infections. So it's unclear at this time what, um, what type of fitness factors these dominant clones may have um, for infection in humans. Um, through our more detailed cluster analysis, and using a SNP threshold of 20 SNPs, we identified 29 obsessus and eight miscellaneous clusters of genetically similar isolates. However, only a minority of these clusters included patients from the same CF centers. So really, um, this raises probably more questions than um, we can answer through this study. So for future work, really um, epidemiologic investigations um, are needed and they are ongoing through the HALT and TM trial. And these are single center studies that are evaluating both shared environmental exposures and potential health care associated transmission um, to try to figure out the contributions of these um, to explain these um, genetically similar isolates between patients within the same center. So for more information on both the HALT and TIM study and this epidemiologic um, investigations, please visit poster 301. And then also I have a poster 307 on the same topic if you would like to look at it for more details. Um, and here are acknowledgements. I definitely would like to um, acknowledge the RDP core directors, including our PI, Jerry Nick, um, core directors, Chuck Daly and Michael Strong and former core director, Max Salfinger, who is now at the University of South Florida, our collaborators at the Children's Hospital of Colorado, Stacy Martiniano and Scott Sagal, and of course, the RDP key personnel, including members of the Culture Corps, Vinicius, Josh, and Adra, members of the Molecular Corps, Nabi, Elaine, and Sean, and the members of the Research Informatics Corps, Jeannie, Sarah, and Natalia. And I thank you very much. Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Olivier from the Pulmonary Branch of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. It's my pleasure to discuss today new treatment approaches for NTM pulmonary disease. At this time, I'd like to suggest that you submit questions using the Q&A feature uh, to be answered during the live panel session. It'll take place on Wednesday, October 21st, starting at 3.30. My uh, presenter disclosure, the following relationships exist uh, related to this presentation as shown on this slide. I'd like to also mention that none of the treatments discussed are FDA approved for the treatment of NTM. Emerging therapies can be thought of uh, in several different categories. One is repurposing existing drugs. A second is repackaging um, existing drugs to improve efficacy or reduce toxicity. Um, Next is development of novel drugs targeting NTM. And then finally, augmenting host defense against NTM. And I'll try to present examples of each of these. And this is not uh, by any means meant to be an exhaustive uh, list of uh, new therapies uh, in uh, various stages of development. Looking first at newer antibiotics or newer regimens that are available, um, there are three different uh, sort of categories of these. 
Uh, one is the use of dual beta lactams, and there's in vitro uh, literature to support this principle of beta lactams having different potencies uh, against specific uh, M. abscessus uh, transpeptidases, and combining them uh, gives you lower MICs, a synergistic type effect, than you would see with either uh, of the drugs alone. This includes um, the use of ceftazidine plus either the newer cephalosporin ceftaroline or imipenem, uh, or imipenem relabactam, a new combination drug, uh, plus amoxicillin. Secondly is, are the newer drugs that combine uh, newer types of beta-lactamase inhibitors uh, along with uh, beta-lactam drugs. Uh, and these are non-beta-lactam-based uh, beta-lactamase inhibitors that specifically target the broad spectrum beta-lactamase uh, possessed by M. abscessus. These include avibactam, relabactam, and vabrobactam, and these are available combined uh, with ceftazidime, uh, imipenem, and meropenem, uh, respectively. Uh, we've uh, anecdotally used these drugs in uh, patients, both CF and non-CF, who have had treatment uh, refractory um, responses to guidelines-based therapy uh, and have shown uh, improvement uh, in certainly uh, some of these patients. Uh, the third uh, drug is uh, a newer formulation of um, tigacycline uh, or a, another tetracycline. This has the advantages of being available in both an IV and an oral drug, um, and the side effect profile uh, tends to be more tolerable than tigacycline uh, with equivalent uh, in vitro MICs. And again, we've used this anecdotally uh, with success uh, in patients uh, CF and non uh, with uh, M. abscessus. Our lab has been very interested in uh, repackaging uh, a, an existing treatment. Gaseous nitric oxide is used in the ICU um, for treatment of um, neonatal uh, bronchiolitis. It's used for pulmonary hypertension and as an adjunct for ARDS. And its antibiotic uh, properties have been long touted. Uh, it's been shown in mice models of tuberculosis uh, to have efficacy. Um, and studies looking at using it uh, uh, in uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria uh, utilized uh, an in vitro exposure chamber, uh, and we have one similar to this in our lab where you can expose uh, cultures uh, of the organism to both regulated concentrations of nitric oxide uh, and to uh, air, room air control, uh, and then monitor levels of nitric oxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen in a um, uh, atmospheric controlled uh, outer chamber um, to assess the effect of gaseous nitric oxide on these culture growth over time. Uh, this was looked at um, uh, against a variety of organisms uh, using a concentration of 200 parts per million uh, and then looking at the time for effect against the, against the um, uh, organism to begin and then the time that was required for uh, a lethal dose or 100% killing. Uh, and this combination of time uh, and concentration uh, to equal a quotient of parts per million uh, by time uh, can be construed to either continuous delivery uh, or intermittent bursts of delivery that add up to this total length of time. And if you compare uh, the bacteria to uh, Canada and uh, comparing to the, the um, uh, targeted non-tuberculous mycobacteria of M. smegmatis, you can see relative to the organisms, other organisms, the mycobacteria took the longest time for effect to start uh, and the longest time to achieve uh, a lethal uh, concentration by time uh, compared to these other organisms. There have been clinical studies and uh, two uh, reports of two CF patients uh, who were treated with gaseous uh, nitric oxide delivered uh, by in the hospital by uh, tanks and a blender system uh, through a tight fitting mask. Uh, and in these two patients, they both had quote, aggressive M. abscessus. They were retreated with intermittent pulses of 160 parts per million uh, over uh, three weeks uh, and noted improved uh, well being uh, with no significant adverse events. Um, and looking at a, a derived uh, CFU from quantitative PCR, there was a reduction in the amount of M. abscessus in both patients. This led to a pilot study in nine CF patients with refractory M. abscessus treated with a similar intermittent uh, high concentration regimen um, and again noted improvement uh, or tends to improvement in FEV1 and distance achieved on six minute walk 
uh, with owner only minor AEs, uh, but really no significant effect uh, on the uh, amount of organisms that was seen uh, over um, weeks uh, on treatment or in the weeks following treatment. Uh, and so, um, you know, our lab was very interested in trying to understand this better. Um, we um, paired with an industry partner uh, who had designed a standalone portable unit that could generate nitric oxide from room air. It's about the size of a toaster uh, and it's fitted with a, a coaxial delivery cable um, that goes through a tight fitting face mask uh, with monitoring inline monitoring systems uh, for uh, delivered uh, concentrations of NO, NO2 uh, and oxygen. Uh, we also monitored um, uh, room air conditions surrounding the patient uh, to look for potential um, um, nursing personnel, et cetera, exposure. Um, we uh, got compassionate use to use this in a CF patient who had an eight-year uh, course of multiple antibiotics uh, with failed treatment uh, and had developed significant lung disease and refractory uh, disease. Um, her initial course of this was similar to the two case reports, uh, intermittent dosing uh, over a three-week period. Uh, she tolerated this well. Um, she had a quantitative improvement in quality of life, but again, no significant change in MEPSESA MAP status. Uh, due to how well she felt after this, she requested a second treatment, uh, which we got approval for. And in this time, we titrated her concentration over two days from 160 parts per million to 240 parts per million, closer to the concentration uh, used in the prior in vitro study uh, and administered this five times a day. Um, this had to be stopped early after a week uh, due to development of anxiety, headache, and exertional hypoxemia. It's not clear if this was related to the treatment and that her things like her met hemoglobin levels stayed within the targeted safety range, uh, but nevertheless, it was stopped with no significant change in her microbiology over that short period of time. So we were then interested in looking to see if there might be variability um, in in vitro response uh, to gaseous nitric oxide that might explain some of the difference between response seen in those two case reports uh, versus the pilot study versus the patient that we treated. Uh, so we went back to uh, in vitro exposure um, and we compared um, our um, uh, treatment um, isolate, uh, patient's isolate, uh, which was obtained late in her infection uh, prior to the nitric oxide treatment, had a rough colony morphology, which is generally associated with a worse outcome uh, and host adaptation over time. And we compared that with serial isolates from a published index case of an outbreak in a Seattle transplant center. And these isolates were obtained early in the course of this patient's infection uh, with smooth colony morphology uh, midway in uh, the infection course with, again, smooth uh, colony morphology, and then an isolate that was obtained uh, after a precipitous decline in clinical status, uh, which was rough morphology. Um, we um, constructed time kill curves initially with this initial uh, presumably more sensitive uh, isolate uh, and looked at varying concentrations of nitric oxide that ranged from 160 parts per million to 400 parts per million and showed a dose response effect with 400 parts per million achieving killing within four hours uh, relative to no killing and control uh, and a prolonged time for killing to occur at 160 parts per million. We chose to look further at the sort of mid-range dose of 250 parts per million um, and looked at comparisons of hill slopes, which are derived uh, from individual killing curves. Uh, and displayed here are, are the length uh, or the more negative of these bars corresponding with increased uh, microbial killing. Uh, and comparing um, the isolates uh, occurring uh, early in the clinical course, uh, mid-course and late course of the comparison uh, isolate uh, to our treated patient's isolate uh, shown on the far side. Uh, and so starting first with um, the early infection isolate, uh, we saw significant killing uh, occurring uh, at uh, 250 parts per million in this isolate. Uh, this was more significant than the isolate obtained in the mid-course and late course of infection, uh, where this was a fairly um, uh, treatment-resistant isolate relative to control. Uh, and uh, But the patient's uh, isolate that we treated 
uh, showed even less of a response relative to control um, compared to these earlier course uh, infection isolates. Uh, and so there may be a, a role for this. Uh, it may be more effective early in the disease course uh, of a patient's disease, or it may take repeated uh, exposures over a prolonged period of time, uh, potentially with outpatient administration using this portable unit uh, to have this be a viable therapy. Uh, in terms of uh, repackaging um, uh, available drugs uh, for um, administration, amikacin is a highly efficacious drug against NTM, many species of NTM, uh, but it's a very toxic drug with a narrow therapeutic window. Uh, one approach is to um, look at being able to deliver this orally uh, in sort of a designer drug that would lower toxicity of the drug. Uh, and this drug uses a technology of these uh, multilaminar cochleate uh, structures, uh, which is a combination of phospholipids and calciums that form these spiral um, tightly wound units uh, that can trap both um, uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic drugs uh, within the center uh, of these structures. Uh, and at circulating levels of calcium, they remain tightly wound um, and the, uh, the drug is protected uh, against first pass effect in the liver uh, and circulating uh, av available levels of the drug remain very low. Um, these uh, phospholipid cochleate structures are readily taken up by macrophages, and when they reach the intracellular uh, calcium concentration, uh, they unwind or open up. They release the active drug into the intracellular environment, uh, which allows for intracellular killing uh, and subsequent rupture uh, of the um, uh, phagocyte uh, with a release of drug into the surrounding extracellular environment. Uh, so it's a designer tailored drug uh, with a goal of increasing concentration of the drug in areas of infection and reducing uh, levels of circulating drug that can lead to toxicity. Uh, this has been shown to have preclinical efficacy against both imavium and imabscessus uh, and has completed phase one uh, single ascending dose uh, studies in humans. It was well tolerated with low circulating levels of amikacin. It's obtained the necessary steps for potential fast track approval, similarly to the development process that liposomal amikacin uh, went through with the FDA. Another approach would be to combine uh, amikacin, uh, IV amikacin, with an oral otoprotective drug. Uh, and this takes advantage of a high throughput screening, uh, compound screening system that utilized uh, zebrafish uh, with the similarity between the lateral uh, line hair cells, which zebrafish uh, use for localization and movement, uh, to uh, hair cells of the inner ear, which allowed them to screen these compounds to look for efficac efficacious um, uh, effect against the toxicity of amino uh, glycosides. Um, this prevented uh, high dose amikacin toxicity in a rat model um, without altering the amikacin antibiotic uh, efficacy in that model. Uh, they've completed a phase one a study that was well tolerated uh, with a half-life that was long enough to allow for once daily dosing uh, and phase two studies are being planned. Another repackaged drug is an older drug, clofazamine. This is a riminophenazine uh, dye uh, that was developed in the 1960s as a treatment for leprosy, uh, but has been shown uh, in case series to have some uh, efficacy against NTM. The re, uh, repackaged drug is clofazamine inhalation suspension uh, with the thought of being able to deliver um, the drug directly to the lung uh, for preferential deposition with the potential for improved efficacy and side effects of the drug. It's been shown um, to be efficacious in uh, mice models of both acute uh, and chronic disease uh, with both M. abscessus and M. avium complex uh, when comparing um, a clofazamine inhalation suspension in the solid uh, red bars uh, to oral clofazamine uh, in the striped bars uh, to um, placebo treated or saline treated uh, mice. Uh, and in some cases, it was considerably more efficacious uh, than the oral clofazamine. Um, the company um, is now conducting acute toxicity studies uh, to hopefully enable first in human dosing. Uh, 
moving from repackaging drugs to um, designing drugs specifically for NTM, one of the first drugs to, to be designed specifically for this purpose, um, targets inhibition of DNA replication. Um, and SPR 720 uh, has been shown to have mouse efficacy similar to clarithromycin and amikacin. Uh, and in this graph, the two gray bars uh, on the right um, are um, untreated mice at day 27 and day 61, uh, and comparing that to ascending doses uh, of SPR 720, um, showing uh, efficacy either comparable or uh, greater to that seen with amikacin. It's also uh, been shown to have dose-related clinical efficacy similar to clarithromycin uh, in a hollow fiber model. Uh, and phase one, uh, single uh, and multiple ascending dose studies have shown it to be well tolerated uh, with only mild GI symptoms uh, at the higher dose. And the company has a planned um, uh, phase 2A uh, study with a 28-day uh, monotherapy delivery trial uh, in treatment-naive patients. So more to come on that drug. Um, an example of host-directed treatment uh, is the use of the drug uh, Molgramostim, um, and using that in an inhaled form, uh, this is a recombinant human GM-CSF, uh, which targets macrophage activation with the thought that if you could rev macrophages up, you may be able to increase intracellular killing uh, of NTM. Uh, again, a case report of two patients um, with M. abscessus uh, who were both treated with inhaled GMCSF. The initial patient had this added to a uh, initially successful uh, IV-based regimen, uh, but a failed regimen once um, IV amicacin was converted to inhaled amicacin. Uh, inhaled GMCSF was added to that uh, with rapid achievement of both negative uh, culture and smear status. A second patient who had not been treated uh, was treated with inhaled GMCSF uh, monotherapy uh, and quickly achieved improvement uh, in both culture and smear status of uh, M. abscessus. Um, this has been put into two separate clinical trials. The first was a phase two uh, open label uh, trial in non-CF patients with persistent M. avium complex or M. abscessus uh, with the drug administered over 48 weeks with a 12-week follow-up. This has been completed and the intent to treat analysis uh, had a 21% uh, achievement of culture conversion of M. avium complex um, with no patients with M. abscessus achieving culture conversion. Uh, there were 14 SAEs and three deaths, um, most of which were thought not attributable to the drug. And a second study uh, is, was a phase two open label uh, trial in cystic fibrosis patients, uh, but enrollment uh, has been closed in that study due to an inability to recruit uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. So in summary, uh, I think this is a promising time for NTM treatment. Um, there are drugs coming along that have the promise for increased efficacy, uh, for reduced toxicity and less drug-drug interaction. Uh, these come in different categories, uh, repurposing available drugs. There are certainly other examples in addition to what I presented. Uh, repackaging uh, drugs to improve uh, efficacy or reduce toxicity, uh, and then hopefully uh, additional novel drug um, therapy targeting NTM uh, will be coming down the pike. This has also been associated with uh, increased challenges for NTM treatment, uh, and these have to do with getting these drugs through the development process. Uh, there's a need to optimize trial design, um, there's a need to identify and select um, uh, optimal outcome measures. Uh, there's an ongoing debate with the FDA about uh, being able to show microbiologic efficacy uh, while at the same time uh, showing that the patients feel better, live longer, uh, or function better. That's not always so easy to do, especially in the constraints of trying to limit uh, trial lengths. Uh, and then to efficiently conduct clinical trials that allow both safety and efficacy evaluation of multiple new drugs uh, trying to enter a field of what remains a relatively uh, rare disease. So those are the challenges 
uh, that uh, are presented. Um, but I think there is much more promise now than there has been in the effect uh, in the past. Uh, and I certainly look forward to the future and with the hope of developing shorter, uh, more effica efficacious and less toxic drug regimens. It's been my pleasure to discuss this topic with you today and I'll hope you will present, uh, you'll participate in the live session uh, during the question and answer time. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Stacy Martiniano. I am from the University of Colorado in Children's Hospital, Colorado, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on predict and patients study updates. My disclosures include funding related to this project from the CF Foundation. I'll begin by talking about the prospective evaluation of NTM disease in CF, or the PREDICT trial. The primary objective of this trial is to develop a user-friendly, evidence-based protocol for NTM disease diagnosis to be used for all CF patients in the US. The secondary objectives are also to just define an expected rate of development of NTM disease for patients with positive cultures, to identify clinical features associated with development of NTM pulmonary disease, to establish the feasibility of future multicenter uh, clinical trials, and also to facilitate research in CF host susceptibility, NTM virulence, and biomarker discovery. So the PREDICT in Patients trials began in Colorado in 2014 at the Pediatric and Adult CF Centers. And then were expanded to these sites here, now known as the NTM Consortium in 2018. And these were sponsored by the CF Foundation and TDN Coordinating Center. And sites were chosen due to their interest in NTM research, their relatively high prevalence of NTM in their community, and also due to their broad geographic distribution. Now, PREDICT is a prospective observational study and again held at both pediatric and adult CF care centers in the consortium. And it's really a single algorithm that we follow to use uh, to diagnose NTM disease in patients with CF. And it's based on American Thoracic Society and CF Foundation and European CF Society guidelines. Included are patients with CF who have a recent positive NTM culture within the last two years. Um, they must be six years of age or older and be sputum producing. Excluded are people who have been previously treated for NTM pulmonary disease or have a lung transplant. Here is an overview of our enrollment during the period of the single sunny single center study followed by the multi-center study. Um, and we currently have 180 subjects enrolled out of our target 200. So during this an interim analysis, we'll be reviewing um, demographic data from the 180 subjects enrolled. And on average, our average age is 28 years. The majority of our subjects are female. The majority are white and non-Hispanic or Latino ethnicity. The CF genotype distribution is shown here. And then the median uh, mean lung function at time of enrollment was 77% predicted. Moving down, you can see that the majority of our subjects enrolled currently have MAC. About 31% have abscesses and 13% have either a different NTM species or a dual infection with MAC and abscesses. And then so far at this point, um, 44 subjects or 25% have met criteria for NTM pulmonary disease. Now when looking at the PREDICT subjects, comparing those who have not been diagnosed with NTM disease compared to those who have been diagnosed, we see that those with NTM pulmonary disease diagnosed, that red column, are um, trending to be more predominantly female. There also is a trend that they have lower baseline lung function. Um, they are statistically younger than those without NTM disease. And there's also a different age distribution. So um, those with NTM disease are more commonly between the ages of 6 to 12 or 12 to 18 years of age. 
uh, subjects diagnosed with NTM pulmonary disease are also younger at the time of a first lifetime positive culture. I want to highlight that um, both groups of subjects without NTM disease and with NTM pulmonary disease have a similar distribution of NTM species. So in both groups, about a third have abscesses, half to two thirds have MAC, and the remainder have um, a other species or dual infection. And then among those with abscesses, the majority have Mycobacterium abscessus subspecies abscessus. About a third have uh, Mycelians, and then um, there's just one subject enrolled with a Balletii at this time. Um, next, I'd like to review some of our uh, microbiologic uh, culture data, um, but want to just orient you to the next slide. And so in the next slide, each participant is going to have their own column of um, culture results. And toward the bottom of that column, we're going to see culture results that were historic prior to enrollment in PREDICT. And then we'll see this longitudinal um, culture results that are obtained while in PREDICT. And then at the top, if they're highlighted, that shows those are culture results that were obtained while the patient was on Trikafta, still in PREDICT. And then red dots or squares are going to be positive cultures, blue are negative, and then the open dots mean that there's no data, missing data from that time period. Um, and this is typically that there's just no culture was able to be obtained. So here is a summary of the culture data um, among PREDICT subjects without NTM disease diagnosed, and we're starting with those with MAC. And so we're just starting to see some patterns emerge in this group of subjects. So toward the left side of the screen, you'll see that there's many patients with pretty persistently um, positive cultures. So they would meet microbiologic criteria for disease, but have not yet met clinical criteria, so have not had that disease diagnosis made. Um, toward the middle, we see clustering of subjects who have intermittent positive cultures. And then on the right, we see patients who had historic positive cultures, then enrolled in PREDICT, and then have been pretty, um, pretty persistently negative since enrollment. Uh, here is the same figure now with those with abscesses, and same patterns emerge, some with persistently positive cultures, some with intermittent, and some with mostly negative cultures. And these again are all subjects that remain and predict are followed longitudinally and have not yet made disease diagnosed um, disease criteria. Now here are the two figures together. And again, just highlighting that there's a similar distribution of frequency of positive cultures among subjects with MAC and abscesses and no NTM disease. If you kind of look toward the more recent cultures for the subjects toward the top of each patient's column of results, you'll see a lot of open dots. And what this means is that in reality, 90% of our subjects have had missing cultures in recent quarters for on average six to nine months. And about half of these subjects were started on Trikafta. And so we think that this is related to reduced sputum production while on Trikafta. Um, but then the remainder we hypothesize are likely due in, at least in part to COVID pandemic uh, related clinic shutdowns. So just unable to get that data. So something we certainly hope will improve um, in the coming months as clinics are reopening. Um, regarding follow-up in lung function, on average, patients um, without NTM disease diagnosed have been followed for 20 months and on average seven clinic visits, and the majority of these patients remain in PREDICT and continue to be followed. Um, in those with NTM pulmonary disease diagnosed, um, we diagnosed on average 11 and a half months after enrollment in between five and six clinic visits. When we look at pulmonary function changes over time, we see that those with NTM disease, um, shown in gray, um, initially have some decline in lung function. Um, and then um, if the disease was 
the diagnosis was made beyond two years after enrollment, we see that these subjects um, actually have a pretty significant decline in their lung function, um, up to 6% decline on average. And we feel like this underscores the idea that we should really have some urgency toward making the diagnosis as timely as possible because lung function can be lost if we have those delays. If you look at the patients without NTM disease diagnosed, so that's the black line, these patients on average actually have slight improvement in their lung function for the first one to two years post-enrollment. After that, we do start to see decline in lung function in these patients as well. Um, historically, we have made the disease diagnosis in about 40% of patients with NTM pulmonary um, positive cultures. And at this point in our PREDICT trial, the interim analysis, we're only at about 25% disease diagnosis. And so what we actually hypothesize is that there are some patients in this group that we just have yet to been, been able to make that um, diagnosis, potentially due to um, trichafta and COVID-related shutdowns, et cetera. So certainly something we'll be following as the study continues, um, continues to move on. So the predict key takeaways at this point are about 25% of our participants have met criteria for pulmonary disease. A similar proportion of subjects with MAC and abscesses have been diagnosed with NTM pulmonary disease. Subjects diagnosed with disease were younger at time of first positive culture and also younger at enrollment. And there's a trend toward these patients being more commonly female and having lower lung function. Subjects in PREDICT without NTM pulmonary disease show slight improvements in lung function, at least initially after enrollment. And subjects diagnosed with NTM pulmonary disease two or more years after enrollment have more significant decline, again, highlighting that urgency to make as timely of a diagnosis as possible. And then lastly, trichafta and the COVID pandemic have impacted our ability to monitor microbiologic data. So next, I'd like to talk about the prospective algorithm for the treatment of NTM in CF, or the patient's trial. And the primary objective of this trial is to implement a standardized approach to the treatment of NTM pulmonary disease in our CF population. And this is a prospective open label treatment trial for NTM, and it's a single treatment algorithm for NTM pulmonary disease, again, based on ATS and foundation criteria. Included are patients with CF greater than six years of age who have had that NTM disease diagnosed, um, diagnosis made during PREDICT. And then of course there's intention to treat. Excluded are patients who are pregnant, have a history of transplant, or have had prior treatment of NTM. And here's an overview of our enrollment. Um, currently, we have 43 subjects enrolled out of our target 70. I'd like to quickly go over some highlights of the NTM patient's uh, treatment algorithm. In this trial, there are two primary arms, one for the treatment of MAC and one for the treatment of abscesses. And then within each arm, there is a further division into severe or macrolide resistant arm and then a less severe or macrolide susceptible arm. And then for each of these four arms, we provide a first line uh, recommendation for treatment. But then we have quite a few second line options and those are kind of highlighted on the right. I'll zoom in and show this list again. And so basically, as more drugs have become commercially available with antibiotic activity against NTM, we felt like it was important to expand the protocol to allow these drugs. And these um, expanded protocol drugs are highlighted in the red boxes. And so now the patient's trial really has now less emphasis on the exact type of drug used, but now we're really monitoring outcomes based off if we're using a specific number of drugs and based off treatment duration. And so we're really collecting a lot of real-world effectiveness data on all of these drugs when used in a multi-drug regimen. Here's a summary of the demographics of the participants in patients. I just have it divided by those with MAC and those with abscesses. 
Um, there's nothing statistically significant at this point, but um, highlighting the MAC group in blue, we see that they are more commonly female compared to obsessives, have similar ages between the two, similar age distribution, um, maybe a few more young patients with MAC currently. Um, those with MAC have, an, on average, a slightly higher baseline lung function compared to abscesses. The genotype distribution is the same and shown there. And then lastly, the age at first lifetime culture is a little later in those with MAC compared to abscesses. Um, I just want to show as part of our current assessments for NTM pulmonary disease, we really rely quite a bit on this um, symptoms of a clinical syndrome consistent with NTM, as well as CFQR um, results. And here is a figure summarizing the, result, the clinical syndrome features present at time of NTM disease diagnosis. And you can see the majority of patients have primarily respiratory symptoms at the time of disease diagnosis. So they've increased exacerbations, decline in lung function, or presence of respiratory symptoms such as cough or sputum production. And the majority of these data were collected before trikaftan. You can also see that related to CFQR respiratory domains, those with NTM pulmonary disease have a lower respiratory domain score compared to those without NTM disease, which um, is showing that those with NTM disease have more respiratory impairment. Um, here is a figure showing our um, trends in lung function in subjects and patients, so those on treatment. And what we see are that both participants with MAC and abscesses while on treatment have real stabilization overall of their lung function. Um, this is also in line with what we have seen historically that once on treatment, overall patients have stabilization of lung function decline, but more rarely actually have um, that they rarely regain lost lung function. Um, here are just two summary figures showing culture data among those patients, uh, subjects who are on treatment. We have MAC on top and abscesses on the bottom. And what we have seen so far is that close to 80% of subjects with MAC and 56% of subjects with abscesses have cleared their infection. So the majority of subjects have cleared on treatment trial. More recently, kind of similar to PREDICT, about 60% of subjects have missing culture data um, for the last three to six months. Again, a good number of them are on trikafta, so this is likely related to reduced sputum production on trikafta. And also we think that similarly, there is a COVID um, impact as well. And I just wanna highlight that currently at this interim analysis state, we have minimal microbiologic data post trikafta to really know what the impact is on treatment, but this is certainly something we're um, following closely, especially as clinics are opening to see how, how it is impacting our, our outcomes. Here's just a little more data to show how trikafta and COVID have impacted our trials. And so the top line is uh, that black line shows the number of participants enrolled in the study. And you can see that below that in the gray line, about a third to half of patients come to clinic on, a, um, on average every month. And this makes sense because we recommend quarterly follow-up. So then when trikafta was improved, approved, about half of our participants started trikafta, shown in orange. Um, and after trikafta, we still had pretty consistent clinic visits, but you can see the number of subjects that actually had sputum available, shown in the red line, significantly declined. Then once COVID hit, you can actually see the number of clinic visits start dropping off. And that's also when our culture attainment levels basically went to zero. And then lastly, that blue line at the bottom shows our running average number of NTM disease diagnoses made per month. On average, we were making one to three diagnoses per month. But then again, after trikafta and COVID, our number of NTM disease diagnoses have basically gone down to zero, which we hypothesize is due to improved respiratory symptoms, less sputum production, and then less clinical assessments due to shutdowns. So certainly something we anticipate improving um, and picking back up in coming months. So I'd like to just highlight some 
key uh, takeaways related to patients. Uh, the majority of subjects diagnosed with NTM pulmonary disease have demonstrated increased respiratory symptoms, decline in pulmonary function, and decline in CFQR-related respiratory domain scores. Again, majority of data have been collected prior to TRICAFTA. Um, we've seen that by initiating a standardized treatment regimen, we have seen stabilization in lung function decline, and that our majority of our subjects have had conversion rates to negative. We've seen these promising um, clinical outcomes that we think might be in part due to really optimizing all CF cares first um, during the period of PREDICT. And then we found that um, Trikafta and COVID have impacted our ability to monitor microbiologic criteria and data in respiratory signs and symptoms, but we hope this is somewhat transient. But thinking about conclusions and next steps, especially related to these, these points, um, Overall, we still feel that using a standardized NTM diagnostic and treatment protocol in the CF care center setting is feasible and really has improved care. And these have been really well received by um, the sites in the NTM consortium. And so with that, we are planning to expand to 10 or more additional sites, um, both to help us increase statistical power to find some trends in our, more than trends in our outcomes, and also to expand access to more patients. I want to highlight that these trials are linked to a larger biomarker initiative. And so we are longitudinally banking sputum, urine, blood, chest CT scans, and NTM isolates from these patients. And all these samples are linked with robust clinical data and certainly available um, to our NTM research community. Uh, looking ahead, we think that PREDICT and patients are going to act as a real nice natural history study to help us monitor Trikefta effectiveness and its impact on NTM in our population. And we're also looking closely to see if moving forward we may need to adjust our classic NTM pulmonary disease diagnostic criteria in the era of Trikefta. So certainly more to come there. So lastly, I just want to quickly highlight and thank all those involved in these trials. It really is a huge team effort. Thanks especially to Jerry Nick, my co-PI, and our lead RCs, Marion Jones and Meg Anthony, and the whole TDN Coordinating Center. And just also want to highlight the teams of scientists and colleagues that have helped us design these trials and are working on NTM research in this space. So thank you very much.